Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Michael, and I'm a female alcoholic. (laughs) And uh, I want to thank Dave for inviting me to come share this weekend. I feel very, very humbled. I really do. Um, This conference is just full of my, you know, my AA heroes. And um, to be at a conference with Sue and uh, Smitty is just awesome. And then some of the AA speakers are some of the speakers that I listened to their tapes and they got me sober and they kept me sober through the trials and low spots. And it's, I just, it's just very humbling to be up here tonight. And, um, I've been sitting here fretting of whether I should tell you this joke or not because I don't tell jokes. I can't help it, honey. It just kept going through my head. As I sat here thinking how humbled I was. Okay, do you know the difference between, between a northern fairy tale and a southern fairy tale? Okay, a northern fairy tale starts off once upon a time. A southern fairy tale starts out, you ain't going to believe this shit. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I hope you noticed I did not complete the word. I just said (laughs) S-H. That's all I, I said shh. Because I was taught when I got sober that profanity is not a sign of spiritual growth. So it was all in your mind. (laughs) Anyway, I had to, I had to bring up fairy tales because that's what I feel like my life is. It's an absolute fairy tale. And uh, you ain't gonna believe. And the big book talks about great events will come to pass. And one of the greatest events that's come to pass for me is is my marriage. And, um, you know, I speak at conferences, and they come up to me, and they tell me that they're really disappointed I don't have a Georgia accent, and that's because I I didn't come from Georgia. I came from California. And I, I was speaking at a conference in South Carolina, and I met the man of my dreams, you know, and he was this southern gentleman that, that just swept me off my feet. You know, we had a... A fairy tale romance, you know, an absolute fairy tale romance. Uh, you know, all the things that you read out, reading those little fairy tale books, are what happened to me, where you're actually courted, courted, you're proposed to, you're given an engagement ring. At our age, we did have a short engagement. I was almost 50, and he was almost 60, and uh, we got married on the beach in South Carolina, where we met. And it was a fairy tale wedding. You know, we had six dolphins out there in the ocean, and a rainbow came out, and all AA people, and we opened with the Serenity Prayer and closed with the Lord's Prayer. And and then we were married four days, and I had to go back to California. I had five speaking engagements, and all my tickets were from California, so I left him for five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> then he came to California, and he ha- helped me pick up, pack up my stuff and move to uh, Georgia. And I wish I could tell you that we lived happily ever after. Um, that's not the case. Something. Well, first of all, it was a culture shock. You know, coming from... <laughs> <laughs> Coming from the Los Angeles area, moving to Georgia, and if I had moved to Atlanta, it might have been different, but I didn't move to Atlanta. I moved to Evans, which is, you know, right on the border of South Carolina, and anything I know about a deer is Bambi, and I absolutely love Bambi. And I moved to Georgia, and everybody shoots Bambi. There were dead deer everywhere. You know, and this man shot a squirrel in my tree. You know, I, I just, I was so upset, you know. I just told my husband, I said, well, God, at least in, in Los Angeles, we don't shoot the animals. And he said, no, you just shoot each other. <laughs> but the hardest thing for me to deal with is I also went into menopause. And all I can say is menopause, what an order. My husband just can't go through with it. <laughs> And I know it shocks people. I mean, you should see, when you're up here at the podium, you can see the expression on everybody's face. And it shocks people. You should see some of the people that I've just noticed, you know, when you say menopause from the podium. I was speaking in Cleveland, and um, I said menopause from the podium, and the room just went, (gasps) 
And then this one woman in the front row leaned over to another woman, and she said, did she say menopause? <laughs> you know, I can stand up here, and I can tell you I'm a prostitute, and I'm a thief, and you love me, and you applaud me, but for God's sake, don't say menopause. <laughs> But I believe if something takes you to, sometimes I'll see a man elbow his wife and say, that must be wrong with you, what's wrong with you? But not, <laughs> you know, hot flashes and night sweats, that was the least for me. I developed migraine headaches, I developed a sleeping disorder where I didn't sleep for weeks at a time, and you know, when I first got sober, I heard no one ever died from lack of sleep. Well, you know, they might not have died from lack of sleep, but I know I wanted to kill somebody. I wanted to either kill my husband or kill myself. It was just very dramatic. And I had all these years of sobriety, and I had no idea what was happening to me. I did not know I was in menopause. It was very dramatic. And I feel it like if something takes you to your knees, and you have to start all over on step one, you need to talk about it from the podium. I need to tell people how I got through that, and how I got through that is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, one of my fa favorite um, pages in the big books is at the bottom of of um, 14, top of 15, and it says, for if an alcoholic fails to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive those certain trials and those spots ahead. And that sentence tells me two things. First of all, it tells me if I'm not working with others, I fail to grow spiritually. I can pray. I can meditate, I can go to church. But if I'm not working with others, I fail to grow spiritually. And that sentence also tells me if I'm not working with others, I am not going to survive those trials and low spots ahead. You know, we're guaranteed to have trials and low spots in sobriety. You know, life goes on whether you're sober or not. People still get sick, people still die, <laughs> women still go into menopause. And, uh, <laughs> and so I knew I was desperate to find some, some female pigeons to work with in, in Georgia, you know, and the meeting where I went that I consider my home group, there were very few women, I think there were only two of us, and there were very few newcomers, you know, so I had to drive across on the other side of Augusta to a meeting that they called the newcomers meeting, and uh, at that newcomers meeting, they suggested if you had, and it only met once a week, and if you had less than nine months of sobriety, they suggested you go to this meeting, so I would go to that meeting, and I would plant my fanny into that meeting of newcomers and so for one hour out of the week I did not think about me I didn't think about my nervous breakdown I didn't know I was in menopause I thought I was having a nervous breakdown I started sticking my hand out to those newcomers and I, I started uh, giving them my phone number but I not only gave them my phone number I got their phone number I was in a really bad place, and I was desperate, and so I started calling the newcomers, please let me sponsor you. No. <laughs> if you want what I have. <laughs> I finally started sponsoring, and I finally started to get better. And, you know, one of the women brought, God brought into my life was a woman who was older than I was, and she'd already been through menopause, and she just knew what was happening. You know, she knew what was happening, and she guided me to the help. I, you know, and they say you learn from your sponsorees. <laughs> That's the truth, you know. And she got me to the doctors I needed to go to. And, and uh, my husband and I worshiped the estrogen god. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes I laugh when I hear people stand up here in the podium and say, no, mood-altering chemicals. i got to tell you, estrogen is a mood-altering chemical. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when I crawled through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, over 20 years ago, I had a formal ninth grade education. I didn't know how to work. I lived on welfare. I was reduced to prostitution, and I was a thief. And all of that was before I took that first drink at the age of 25. When I finally broke down and took that drink, I immediately went downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Little slow. <laughs> So as you can see, there's nothing in my background that's prepared me for speaking except for the fact that I am an alcoholic. And I try to speak from the heart. And I always heard that Alcoholics Anonymous is the language of the heart, where the heart speaks and the heart listens. And I really want to welcome the newcomers. And I like newcomers to know that the absolute highest you get in Alcoholics Anonymous is sober. It is not a speaker. 
And I am not an authority on AA. I'm just up here sharing my personal experience, strength, and hope. And the things I say from the podium are the things that had a profound effect on my personal sobriety. I'd like to welcome those of you who are not so new but are having difficulty with this program. I saw a sign in an AA club that always gave me a lot of hope, and that sign says that you're not a failure unless you quit trying, and I believe that's true. So please, whatever you do, just keep coming back. But I was told early on in this program that this program is not for spectators. This is a program of action, and those actions are the 12 steps as laid out in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, Dr. Bob, one of our co-founders, said if you summer those 12 steps into two words, those two words would be love and service. And before he said that, he said, I want to emphasize the simplicity of this program. Let's not louse it up with Freudian complexes that are interesting to the scientific mind but have little to do with our actual AA work. And I see a lot of things drifting in and out of AA today. They might not be Freudian, but they're just as useless. And what they do, <laughs> and what they do is they just complicate this very simple program. Now, in the big book, under doctor's opinion, it tells me that many types of alcoholics do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. So I'm here tonight to tell you that I'm one of those alcoholics. In fact, so is my mom. We both tried to recover from this disease through the psychiatric effort. Different times, but we went to the same psychiatrist. Of course the result was nil, but the good news is that today that very same psychiatrist is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> My mom and I both tried to recover from this disease through the religious effort, different times in different congregations, and believe it or not, today that very same minister that counseled me <laughs> is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I like to joke around and say I think we drove these two men to drink, but the truth is, and this is the truth, my mom slept with the psychiatrist and I slept with the minister. <laughs> And that's why I'm usually invited to be the Sunday morning spiritual speaker. <laughs> but one thing I know for sure is that psychiatrists, that minister, and myself are perfect examples that AA works when other things fail. A little bit about my background. First of all, I'm Irish, German, and Cherokee, and I'm illegitimate. <laughs> and are you illegitimate? <laughs> <laughs> Being born out of wedlock today is just not a big deal, but when I was a little girl growing up, it was, and my childhood is pretty appalling, so in my mom's defense, I want to tell you a little bit about her childhood, because as bad as mine was, my mom's was worse, and this program gave me the ability to have a very loving relationship with my mom, even though she couldn't quit drinking, and I lost my mom eight years ago. She died of lung cancer. I had the opportunity to practice love and service at home. My sister and I took my mom home. We had hospice come in, and my mom actually got to die with a little bit of dignity. I had the ability to get in bed with my mom, hold her all night, and just love her unconditionally. And I had to watch this woman drink on top of morphine up until the day she could no longer swallow. And it's probably one of the hardest things that I've ever done. But one thing I learned from this whole experience is that my whole life growing up, I was so focused on the things I hated about my mom, the things I didn't want to be like that I missed all of her wonderful qualities. My mom had a lot of wonderful qualities, and I really miss her a lot today. But my mom came from an alcoholic background, and when she was 13, her mother was murdered in a drunken brawl. A drunk slit my grandmother's throat. So that left my mom out on the streets at the age of 13 trying to raise herself. At the age of 14, she had her first baby, which she gave up for adoption, and then she had me. And she did everything in her power to keep me. She later met this man, got married, had three boys. We all moved to California. That marriage soon ended in divorce, and my stepdad moved back to Colorado. So that left my mom out in California trying to raise four little kids. And we were raised on welfare. We were raised in extreme, extreme poverty, always having lights, gas, telephones turned off, always being evicted, even sleeping in cars. And then I had to deal with my mom's alcoholism, I had to deal with her prostitution, and I had to deal with her suicide attempts. When I was 12, my mom got pregnant again, and this time she sent my three younger brothers to live with their real dad 
in Colorado. Now, my three brothers were my very best friends. When you're sleeping in cars and always being evicted, you don't have an opportunity to make friends. So my brothers were my friends. So I feel like at the age of 12, I already had all these feelings that I later brought with me, Alcoholics Anonymous. And those feelings were of low self-worth, low self-esteem, not equal to, and just not good enough. And that was a direct result of all that poverty. The drunken psychiatrist pointed out to me that I had issues of abandonment. You know, I never knew my real dad. My stepdad went away. My three brothers went away. My mom's always trying to kill herself. And because of some other childhood experiences, I would say I'm a fear-based person. I have always been afraid of people, places, and things. And the two very important things I learned when I got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is, first of all, I learned that feelings are not facts. All those things I used to think about myself are not the truth. And best of all, I learned how to walk through fear. And I learned that every time I walk through fear, I'm actually exercising faith. And this last eight or nine years, I've walked through one of my biggest fears, and it's getting on airplanes. It took me 12 and a half years of sobriety to finally get on an airplane. And I found out that I'm not even afraid of flying. I'm afraid of crashing. <laughs> my sponsor told me I'd better be clear on what my fear was when I was asking God to remove it. But I hear a lot of things in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that are not necessarily in the big book. And the one thing I used to always hear is that you could not have fear and faith at the same time. That if you had fear, you didn't have any faith. And I could not figure out what I was doing wrong in my program because I was still riddled with fear. And I had worked these steps as hard as I could work these steps. I have had spiritual experiences, but I still had all this fear. And I'd go up to some of these people that would make this statement. And I remember this one real... um arrogant man you know I went up to him and I said what am I doing wrong in my program and he goes well it sounds to me like you haven't taken a thorough third step well today I know that the third step's only a decision that's all the third step is and to follow up on that decision is I have to take those actions of four through nine finally I went up to one of the old timers in the Long Beach area Kelly might have known him. did you know Bill Honeycutt oh, yeah. Frank's brother I, I went up to um this old timer in uh, the Long Beach area and I was crying on his shoulder and I was asking him about this fear and faith and thing and, and he said Michael nowhere in the big book at least in the first 164 pages does it tell you you cannot have fear and faith at the same time and then he took me to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and he opened a page to me and it's page 68 and it's under the, the fear inventory and he pointed out a sentence to me and that sentence says all men of faith have courage all men of faith have courage. And then he pointed out to me, you don't need courage unless you're afraid. And then he took me to the bottom of that paragraph where it gives you that little fear prayer. And it says, God, remove my fear and direct my attention to what you'd have me be. And I'm always directed to work with another alcoholic, whether they're another alcoholic, another person, whether they're in the program or out of the program. If I can get out of me and I can think about you or think about someone else, God can get in there and fix the situation. And uh, when I first started um, flying, I'd run around the airport looking for ladies I could help with their baggage. You know, I was so... <laughs> I scared a few of them. Give me that bag. <laughs> you know, I did. That was the only way I could get on an airplane is if I could find somebody that I could help. That's the only way I could get on the airplane. And when I'm sitting on the airplane and we're in turbulence, you know, and you can't run around there, let me help somebody. <laughs> you know, I'll sit there and I'll think of people I know who need prayers. And I'll start praying for the people that I know need prayers. And that's how I get through it. Even today, that's how I get through it. Anyway, in that paragraph, after it says a little fear prayer, the very last sentence says, at once we commence to outgrow fear. It does not say at once we outgrow fear. It says we commence to outgrow fear. So I'm here 20 years sober telling you I'm still commencing. <laughs> so, But thank God for steps 10 and 11 in the big book. In fact, you know, fear is such a big deal for a lot of alcoholics. And I'd say probably most, are, most alcoholics because we have to do a whole inventory on fear. And then in steps 10, it tells you that you're to continue watching for fear. And it says it's not an overnight matter. And it says it should continue for a lifetime and then step 11 it says on retiring at night 
and says, so look at your day. Were you afraid? Do I need to share it with another person? And at the bottom of that paragraph, it says that I ask God for forgiveness, and I ask what corrective measures need to be taken. And, you know, there was a period in my life where I was having severe panic attacks in my car when I was driving, and so I quit driving, and... Uh, I just heard somebody at a meeting talk about being housebound, and it started with having panic attacks in their, their car. You know, what was happening to me, I was just going to meetings, going to work, going to home. And when I heard uh, her little story in this meeting, I knew that that was happening to me. So I went home, never shared that with my sponsor. You know, I never told her that I was only driving to certain places because I was afraid. I went home, and I listed these panic attacks on my step six. I called my sponsor, and I shared it with her. We said the seven-step prayer asking to have these removed, and my sponsor gave me corrective measures to take. She had me get on the freeway the very next day and get off on the first exit. She had me get on the freeway the next day and get off on the second exit. She had me get on the freeway the third day and get off on the third exit. And I started to commence to outgrow that fear. And I just think you better be prepared when you turn your one your life over to God as I did at that time because then I got, I was forced to speak at my very first meeting. I never even shared my story till I was 11 years sober. I was terrified of people and standing up here at the podium. And from that meeting, I got invited to speak at three more. And then I had to start driving out of the city. And I was in terror all the time. And then I got invited to speak at my first convention and had to get on an airplane. So uh, the first two years that I was speaking for Alcoholics Anonymous, I was in terror all the time. It was just constant walking through fear, constant. But if I hadn't had the willingness to do that, I wouldn't have gotten to know the wonderful people. I would never have gotten to meet Bob. I would never have gotten to meet Sue, Frank, Sharon. Oh, I already knew Sharon, but she's just my rock. You know, all these people, I would never have met my husband. You know, these are some of the gifts, just just the willingness to walk through that fear is exercising faith. And great events will come to pass. Anyway, when I was 13, my mom did have this baby, and I had to learn how to be a mom, and I didn't even know how to be a kid. My mom's alcoholism took her out of the home. She was never, ever around. And I had full responsibility of this little baby. This little baby is sleeping in a dresser drawer. And I um, eventually had to potty train her, bottle break her. I'm feeling in school because I can't get to school because of this responsibility. Now, after doing my inventory, I found out the truth was I hated school anyway. Now, when I went to school... I was either an object of pity around my peers or I was teased about the way I dressed and teased about my hair. So specifically, to get out of my home life, at the age of 15, I got married. And the man I married was 18. He lived in the neighborhood. He came from a similar background. And I have such a colorful past that I like to brag about this. I want everyone here to know when I got married at the age of 15, I was not pregnant. At the, <laughs> at the age of 15, I had high morals and high values. I really did. Um, I had these two TV shows I used to watch. They were my favorite programs, and most of you are too young to remember these shows, but it was Donna Reed and Father Knows Best. And these were family programs, and because of these programs, I had these high morals and high values. My whole life growing up, all I knew is when I grew up, I didn't want to be an alcoholic like my mom, and I didn't want a prostitute like my mom. So when I got married at the age of 15, I had this wild idea that I was Miss Donna Reed, marrying Mr. Father Knows Best, and unfortunately it didn't turn out that way, and I believe the man I married was an alcoholic. One indication, his name was Johnny Walker. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to share a story with you about that sister of mine. The one that slept in the dresser drawer. Because when I got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I used to blame my alcoholism on my mom's alcoholism. And I blamed the way I turned out on the way I was raised. And after I got sober in this program, I took a good look at that sister of mine because she came from the very same background. In fact, I would say her childhood was worse than mine because my mom's disease had progressed. And my sister was literally forced to move out of the house at the age of 16. So she quit school and she moved out. But what she did when she moved out is she took that high school equivalency test and she had to take it three times until she finally passed it. With this test under her belt, under a special youth program, she went to work for the city of Long Beach. At the age of 26, she retired from the city of Long Beach. She took her 10 years retirement pay. She bought her own business. She later married the head traffic engineer for the city of Long Beach. And eight years ago, at the age of 30, my sister was awarded Woman Entrepreneur of the Year. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
but I have to admit that even today sometimes I still don't get it. <laughs> same mom, same background, but different reactions. And the difference is my sister is not an alcoholic. My sister is not bodily and mentally different from her fellows. My sister reacts to life situations differently than I do. So today I get to accept responsibility, and I can no longer blame those people, places, and things. I am an alcoholic, and I do have a disease, but today I have a solution. And for me, part of my solution is being accountable for my actions my past actions and my present actions. So anyway, at the age of uh, 15, I did get married. At the age of uh, 17, I did have a baby. At the age of 18, I had to get out of this marriage because this man took me through a whole new phase of alcoholism. I never experienced with my mom, and it's called physical abuse. And he never abused me unless he was drinking, but he abused me to the point of cutting me up with a knife and I had to have surgery to repair the damage. So I got out of that marriage at the age of 18, and I feel like that's when I started on the road of being everything I swore I'd never be, doing everything I swore I'd never do. Hadn't even taken a drink of alcohol yet. I always intuitively knew if I took a drink, I'd be an alcoholic. But it started out with me being a single mother living on welfare. My whole life growing up like that, I swore when I grew up I wasn't going to live like that, and there I was. Now, on page 23 in the big book, it says the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than his body. So we're talking about the main problem being the mental obsession and not the physical allergy. So I know for me, I practice my disease of alcoholism, way before I ever took that first drink because I have always had the mental obsession part of this disease. And I practiced it in the form of compulsive overeating. I would shove food in my mouth instead of alcohol. And then I discovered that wonderful world of diet pills. And this, back, this is back in the days when doctors gave really good, good amphetamines. Methadrine, dexedrine, it's illegal now. So anyway, I went on this diet for 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> when I finally took that drink of alcohol at the age of 25, I immediately had the physical allergy from that very first drink. I had the phenomenon of craving. From that very first drink, I had a personality change. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you read about that in the big book? The big book refers to that as a real alcoholic. And I personally am so physically allergic to alcohol. When I consume alcohol, I break out in a rash, welts and hives all over my body. And I was always too drunk to have a clue that that wasn't normal. And if I'd had a clue, it wouldn't have made a difference. But from that very first drink, I drank morning, noon, and night, and I did not draw a sober breath from the age of 25 to the age of 31. And this is not an exaggeration. I had this huge spiritual experience way before I ever got to this program. And this was equivalent to the one that Bill had in Bill's story. Now, in the big book, it says, as a result of a spiritual awakening, you'll have a change in psyche, a change in attitude. It says you'll have this huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. And this spiritual experience I had was not enough for me to achieve that. And I believe it's because I did not have a plan of action to go with it. But it was enough for me to come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. So what I did with this experience is I went to this church. I counseled with this minister. I told him all about my spiritual experience. I shared with him all my character defects and all my shortcomings. And this man assured me if I got really active in this church and I read all these inspirational books and I did all this positive thinking and all these affirmations that I could be everything that I ever wanted to be. Now, after I got to this program, I heard a speaker at the podium say, if you're alcoholic, you cannot think your way into right action. He said, if you're alcoholic, you have to act your way into right thinking. And I am absolute proof of that because I got really active in that church. I even became the secretary of that church, and I struggled reading those books because I could barely read. I did all that positive thinking, constant, constant affirmations, and the only thing that resulted is I ended up having a torrid affair with this minister, <laughs> and it absolutely infuriated his wife. <laughs> and... <laughs> And the rest of the congregation wasn't too excited about it either. <laughs> but the one thing I'm going to share with you now is the one thing I thought I'd take to the grave with me. As secretary at that church, it was my job to handle the money. And when I handled that money, I stole part of that money. Now, at that point in my life, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt my only hope was God. Because I just had a spiritual experience, and I turned to God for help, and I ended up seducing his minister, 
and ripping off his church. So I truly know the feeling of hopelessness that they talk about in the big book. And I'm going to share two stories with you while I'm on the subject of the minister. And I like to share this first story because it's the first time I was ever able to laugh at any part of my alcoholism. When I got to this program, I heard that laughter was healing, but I always thought my story was just much too serious. And when I got here, I used to hang out at the very back of the room. And I have a friend named Teddy. And Teddy calls the back of the room the half measure section or the denial section. (laughs) Now, I didn't hang out back there for either of those reasons. I hung out back there because I was scared to death that they would ask me to read something. I was just couldn't read something, and I literally could not say the word anonymity for over six months, so I'd always hide out at the back of the room. And in California, it's very theatrical, right, Kelly? Very theatrical. And so in California, we have some very funny speakers, and speakers would get up at the podium and share their story, and everybody would laugh. And at first, I was just absolutely incapable of laughing. But one day after I had some sobriety under my belt, I caught myself in the back of the room laughing, too. But right after having this huge belly laugh, I found myself thinking, well, that might be funny for you, but there is nothing, absolutely nothing in my background I could ever laugh at. And then about eight or nine years ago, I was speaking in Seal Beach, California. It was just my second time to ever give an AA talk, and my daughter wanted to come hear me. Now, my daughter got to this program for the first time when she was 15 years old, and because of a tragedy at the age of 18, she lost her sobriety, and she struggled in and out, in and out, in and out, because she lost her faith in God. Uh, Today, she is 35 years old, and she has almost eight years of big book sobriety, and I'm very proud of her. Thank you. Um, Anyway, this is a period of time when she was trying to come back in, and she heard I was talking at this meeting, so she wanted to come hear me. But before the meeting, she brought some of her program girlfriends over to my house. We sat down. We had coffee. Then my daughter proceeded to tell her friends my drunkalog, and it was just the first time I was ever able to laugh at anything. For some reason, it was a little funny, funnier coming out of her mouth and out of my head, you know, and she's telling these girls all about the minister, and, um, (laughs) you know, I just never thought about how some of this stuff looked through the eyes of a nine-year-old. She was nine years old when I seen this minister, so she's telling these girls, I'm dragging her off to church every day, and she's learning things like the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule. I'm constantly preaching all this religious stuff to her. She comes home from school at three o'clock in the afternoon. She opens the bedroom door, and they're naked and with the with her mom was the minister of the church, and when she's the married minister of the church, and when she first said this to her friends, I just felt all the shame, all this guilt, and I just looked at my daughter in the most sympathetic way, and I said, "God, honey, that had to be a terrible shock." And my daughter just looked at me and she said, no, mom, I don't know what shocked me the most, seeing that minister naked or seeing his artificial leg on the floor. until that time, I forgot he had this artificial leg. It was a huge leg. I don't know how I forgot it. (laughs) But this man in no way was disabled. (laughs) Hot flash. got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and I started working those 12 steps, I found for me the most important step was step nine. Now, step nine is the amend step, the step where you make restitution. And I recommend you do the first eight steps before you get to step nine. I know some people come into this program, they take a look at step nine, it's so scary, they turn around and they leave. Others come in and start right in on step nine and make very inappropriate amends. I believe the steps are in order for a reason, and I believe this one in particular should be taken with the advice of a sponsor. But I call step nine the freedom step. This is the step that truly, truly freed me from the bondage of my past. And it's just not a coincidence that those promises come, the promises in the big book, the first step there on page 83 and 84, come after step nine. 
It says before you're halfway through, you're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. It says you won't regret the past or wish to shut the door on it, and so on and so on. And I did not have to wait to get halfway through step nine. That happened to me with my very first amends, and that was going back to that church and telling that minister I used to steal from the church funds. <clears throat> and he told me he knew that. And I set up a payment schedule to pay him, pay back the church. Then I had to tell him that I used to steal out of his wallet when he was in the shower. He told me he did not know that. So, so I made restitution to him. But the neat thing about this whole experience is he shared with me at that time he knew exactly what I was doing. By the time I got to him, he had two years of sobriety in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. When he lost his leg in that motorcycle accident, he was an alcoholic and a drug addict, and he actually died on the operating table. He had one of those near-death experiences, which for him was his spiritual experience, and that's what led him into ministerial school and becoming a minister. And even he could not get sober in church. And I'm not putting down churches, and I'm not putting down the psychiatric effort, because the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous makes it real clear that this program owes a lot to both of these institutions. And in the big book, it says if you need professional help, do not hesitate to seek it. But i got to tell you, for me, it was all about that miracle that happens when one drunk reaches out to another drunk. So anyway, I've been kicked out of this church. I'm 27 years old. I'm full on into my drinking. I'm living in an apartment I'm being evicted from. This is my normal M.O. I'm always being evicted. Lights and gas had been turned off for a long time, but I still had a telephone. It was one of my working priorities. And I got this call at 11 o'clock at night, and I could not believe the man on the other end of this phone. It was my real dad. Now, I barely knew this man name was on my birth certificate, and he wanted to make amends for not being in my life. He wanted to get to know me, and he wanted to get to know my daughter, so he offered me an opportunity to move to Colorado to get to know his whole family, and I didn't want to go. I didn't have any desire to get to know him, but mostly I didn't want to move to the snow, but at that point in my life, I didn't have anywhere to go except for out on the streets, but deep down inside, I did have this little hope if I did this geographic, maybe I could change, so I made that move to Colorado, and I lived there for three months, and that three months period, this man and his family could not wait to kick me out of the state of Colorado. <laughs> in that three-month period, I ended up having affairs with the bus drivers on the way over there, getting pregnant, having an abortion, falling down the stairs and breaking my leg, ripping off his medicine cabinet, ripping off his booze cabinet, ripping off his money. So they literally kicked me out of the state of Colorado. I'm going to tell you how I broke that leg. Obviously, I was drunk. And in the neighborhood where I lived, the liquor stores closed at 12, and I had to make my final liquor run before the stores closed. And I lived in a second-floor apartment. It's snowing outside. The stairs are very icy. And I'm walking down the stairs. I'm hanging onto the railing with my right hand, and my, my nine-year-old daughter's on the left side of me trying to hold me up. And all of a sudden, I looked up at another second-floor apartment because the door just opened. And out of that door walked a priest. I don't know what he was doing there, but he had the collar, the robe, everything. He is definitely a man of God. And I am very angry at God. I'm angry at God because I just seduced his minister and ripped off his church. So now I'm mad at God. And I let go of the railing with my right hand. I flipped up my middle finger, and I said, F you, God. And I immediately fell down the stairs and broke my leg. <laughs> now... <sighs> My daughter tells me that is the day she started believing in a punishing God. <laughs> and today we both know I fell because I was drunk. It had nothing to do with God. I was drunk. But anyway, my real dad was second on my list of amends to make when I started making my amends. And I wrote this man a letter. And I told him I was sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I wanted to make restitution for my behavior up there. And I sent him a check trying to... Uh, set up a payment schedule to pay him back. And basically what he and the family did is they sent me the check back with a little note that said they didn't want my money and they never wanted to hear from me again. I was working with a sponsor, so of course I stayed sober, but I really did want to make these amends. So on every Father's Day and on every birthday, I would send him a card. I would tell him I was still sober in the program of Alcoholic Synonymous, and I still wanted to make restitution. And he would never, ever acknowledge me. And I did this for years and years, and he wouldn't acknowledge me. Finally, in 1985 or 1986, I got a reply back. And I cannot tell you how excited I was when I saw the return address on that envelope. And I ripped open the envelope and the only thing that was in it was a picture of his tombstone in the obituary of the newspaper. He had just died, 
And that was the family's way of telling me not to bother trying anymore. And there are no words to express the kind of pain I felt. You would have thought I knew in my whole life, and I didn't. But I took it real, real hard. And the people in Alcoholics Anonymous pointed out to me I don't make amends for approval. The big book tells me I don't make amends to be forgiven. I make amends to clean up my side of the street. I make amends to stay sober. So all I can tell you is that those actions I took worked. Because not once, not even once, was I ever tempted to drink over that rejection. I'm just so sorry he did not get to know the person I am today, because I know he would have been proud. So I've been kicked out of this church, and now I'm kicked out of a state. I'm living back in Long Beach, California. I'm living across the street from Franklin Junior High. Franklin Junior High is a gang-related school. My daughter's now 14 years old, and she's running with a very dangerous gang. I'm doing awful, humiliating, embarrassing things to my daughter. But I was not only embarrassing my daughter, I was embarrassing this entire gang. I was... <laughs> <laughs> This is really true, too. <laughs> I was living in another apartment I was being evicted from. Lights and gas and telephone had all been turned off for a long time, and I'm hiding out from the landlord because he's always trying to serve me an eviction notice. So I always kept my drapes closed so he wouldn't know I was in the house. And with those drapes closed, my apartment is very dark. It's always dark, and it's so dark that now I'm seeing evil spirits. And unless you've seen them, these, these evil spirits are hard to describe. But these evil spirits would do things to me, like follow me around the house, and then I, in turn, would do things like crawl out of the house on my hands and knees, butt naked, across the street to the school ground, and warn my daughter and her gang friends not to come home because the house was possessed with evil spirits. <laughs> and this is the kind of stuff I did that makes me wish to God I was a blackout drinker. But I'm not a blackout drinker. I get to remember all of it. All the neighbors felt sorry for my daughter. Do we have music playing? <laughs> They're still here. No. <laughs> That music was on the tape, today, so they don't think I'm crazy. <laughs> <What music? laughs> All the neighbors felt sorry for my daughter. They would feed her. They would hide her out. Sometimes they would even feed me. Once we're next to her at the neighbor's house, she was feeding both of us. And on her counter, she had a bottle of 100-proof vodka. Well, um, something happened outside a car accident or something. My neighbors and my daughter went to check it out. And um, so I just lagged behind because I wanted to drink some of that vodka down real fast and not get caught. I was always promising my daughter I wouldn't drink. And so I just grabbed that bottle. I started drinking right out of the bottle, which was the way I normally drink anyway. But I started drinking right out of the bottle. I don't know how much I drank or how fast I drank it, but I do know it was enough to stop my respiratory system. At that point, I stopped breathing. And I can remember the sensation. I couldn't breathe. That's the last thing I remember. I don't remember the paramedics. I don't remember being rushed to the hospital. I don't remember being brought back to life. By the time I had any memory, I woke up and both my arms were strapped down to a hospital bed. A nurse was slapping me in the face because I was screaming obscenities at her because I was a very mean and vile drunk. But this experience did get my attention. This time I had almost died under the influence of alcohol. Under the influence of alcohol. And it scared me. I did not want to die out there, so I finally, finally started listening to my daughter because my daughter used to tell me on a daily basis, she would say, Mom, it's the alcohol, and if you wouldn't drink, you wouldn't do those things. She said, just smoke pot. So <laughs> this is my only experience smoking pot, but I was trying really hard not to drink that day. I don't have any friends of my own, so I smoked this pot with my daughter and her friends. And afterwards, we're walking down the street, and I have on these tight, tight jeans. And I have both my hands stuck down in my pockets. And I don't know if I tripped over a crack or tripped over my own foot, but I tripped. I just started to go down. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been on pot, but for me, it was different. First of all, I had the feeling that I was in slow motion. I had the sensation that that cement was coming up at my face, and no matter what I did, and I tried really hard, I could not get my hands out of my pocket. <laughs> So you've got to picture this grown woman laying with her face smashed with cement. Both of her hands are still sticking out of her pockets. 
and all those kids standing around me were laughing hysterically. They were absolutely hysterical. Now, I guess when you smoke pot, you laugh a lot. I don't know. I wasn't laughing. <laughs> but I was laying there, and I could hear all of them laughing. And as I heard that laughter, I, I had that moment of clarity. I knew right then and there, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that pot was not the answer. And I went, I went right back to my drinking, and I drank at the same pace for a while longer. And I used to stand up there and say, I don't know what happened. I finally was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. But today I do know what happened. I finally reached a point you read about on page 151 mm-hmm. in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it talks about facing those hideous four horsemen. It wasn't the things that I did and that happened to me that got me sober. It was the feelings that got me sober. I woke, woke up on my front room floor one meeting. <laughs> one meeting. I woke up on my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, meeting of the spirits. <laughs> I woke up on my floor one morning and um, I felt those feelings, those feelings of terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. I was laying in a puddle of fluid. I don't know what the fluid was. I took the first three steps. I knew that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life had never, ever been manageable. I already believed that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I just didn't know if he would because of what I'd done to the church. And this was my way of turning my will and my life over to the care of God as I just got on my knees and I just said, God, please. I don't care how you do it, but please just get me sober. And I managed to get to a telephone. I called a prayer line that was affiliated with the church I was in, and I asked them to pray for me. Because I thought in my mind, if God wouldn't listen to my prayers because of what I'd done to the church, maybe God would listen to their prayers. And they prayed for me for 30 days, and within 30 days I was sober. And it's a series of God coincidences that landed me in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because I would never have come to AA. I hated Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a good thing I told God I didn't care how he did it, just get me sober. But my mom was in and out of AA for years, and she proved to me it didn't work. She would do the AA two-step, first step, 12 step, no steps in between. But my mom hung around with some really sleazy AA men. And there's not only sleazy AA men, there's sleazy AA women. And there's people in these rooms, and not usually at conventions. Usually people who come to conventions are pretty serious about the program. You know, but in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, there are people in there that are just taking up space. They don't care about the 12 steps, and they don't care about the 12 traditions. And uh, these were the kind of uh, uh, people my mom hung out with. And uh, I was a very young girl, 12 or 13, and two of these men made very serious passes at me. And so that's what I thought about the men in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think our actions out there are very important because we might be the only copy of a big book someone comes in contact with. Anyway, so it's a series of God coincidences that landed me in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so physically sick from withdrawals, there's no way I would have made that meeting without a drink. I ended up having two drinks before the meeting, that's the, two beers before the meeting. That's the last drink I ever had, and that was on November 10th, 1979. However, I don't celebrate my birthday to January 23rd, 1980, when I gave up uh, those diet pills. Um, we had, uh, you know... We had this one old-timer, if you mentioned the word drug, well, let me talk about the old-timers first. The old-timers in the Long Beach area are the ones that latched on to me, and they're the ones that got me sober. And I did have a female sponsor, but the people that latched on to me were the men of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they were just the most precious gifts God could have given to me because I had a very bad relationship with with men, any man I didn't trust. And uh, these were the father images that I never had. And there was absolutely, they, you know, within the first two weeks they gave me a coffee commitment. They were taking me to hospitals, sanitariums, detoxes, jails. They were taking me to prisons. I didn't have enough sobriety, but I think they were teaching me about the yets that were out there if I went back out and drank. And there was no worry about the 13th step. Is there anybody here who doesn't know what the 13th step is? A lot of experience here in Florida, right? (laughs) There was no worry about the 13th step. First of all, I was not 13th steppable. You should have seen me. I was huge. I was very, very obese. I had all this wild, wild bleach blonde hair. I don't know if you've ever been drunk and tried to bleach your hair, but you do a thing called overlapping. (laughs) And it causes your hair to break off. And then I'd fall asleep at times with the bleach on my hair smashed inside a few little bald spots. And then the, the last two months, I didn't... I was drunk all the time. I didn't care about my hair at all. And so I had some big black roots, a few bald spots, and different lengths of broken off bleach blonde orange hair. And a few years ago, that would have been in style. But when I got... (laughs) 
When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, that was not in style, and my front teeth were worn up to here, so it looked like I had no front teeth. I was an alcoholic woman that didn't bathe. I was always profusely sweating. I wore this big purple serape to cover my body in hopes that you wouldn't see me. So there was no worry about the 13th step. These guys were just desperate to clean me up (laughs) and get me sober. But anyway, as I said... um, that one old timer in in the rooms, if you mention the word drugs, he'd jump up, cuss you out, and tell you to go to NA, and then he'd stomp right out of the room. So I learned early on in my sobriety to keep my mouth shut about those diet pills. But what that did for me is that allowed me to take diet pills for three more months. But when I quit drinking, I started working my steps, and God revealed to me right away in my steps that I wasn't sober if I was abusing those pills. So I gave those up January 23rd, 1980, and that's when I celebrate my birthday. So anyway, I go into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have two beers in my system, so now I have just a little bit of a personality change going on. Okay, I admit I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not an alcoholic like you guys, because you guys are alcoholics like my mom. It's a disease of perception. First person showed that he had been a blackout drinker. I looked at my 14-year-old daughter, and I said, I have never had a blackout. The next person showed that he'd been to jail. I looked at my daughter, and I said, I have never been to jail. The truth is, I was a home drinker. I was always too drunk to get out of my house to get arrested. (laughs) And when I crawled out on my hands and knees, a gang member would capture me and put me to bed. But the third person who shared, shared that he had five 502s. Now, back in California, a 502 was a drunk driving. And you had to see me. I was just so defiant. I had my arms crossed like this. And word for word, I said to my daughter, I said, that does it. I have never ever had a drunk driving. And this time my daughter looked at me with all the hate, all the contempt a pre al could have in her eyes and word for word she said, Mom, you don't even have a car. (laughs) 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 But when she said that, something clicked for me. At that point, I knew I was just sitting there looking for the differences. So if any of you are new or nearly new, I hope you're not trying to judge your alcoholism by my actions. And I know that I have a story that's hard to identify with. But maybe you can identify... (laughs) I hope. (laughs) But maybe you can identify with the feelings. You know, maybe you've had those feelings of low self-worth, low self-esteem, not equal to, and just not good enough. Maybe you've had those feelings of overwhelming fear, and this is the kind of fear that paralyzes you. It keeps you from going back to school. It keeps you from getting a better job. It did that for me, but it also kept me from getting on elevators, couldn't drive over over bridges, couldn't get on airplanes, couldn't drive on freeways. It made my world real, real small. I used to have severe panic attacks behind my parents' variety. Or maybe you're like the alcoholic they talk about in the big book, grandiose and better than. To me, it's all the same for an alcoholic. It's just that my ego was in reverse. There's nothing as self-centered as low self-esteem and self-centered fear. But the next person who shared was my point of identification. And I believe if she hadn't been in that meeting that night, I might not be standing here tonight because of my attitude. But she said that she did not drink till later on in life. She said she practiced her disease of alcoholism way before she ever took that first drink, and she did it in the form of compulsive overeating and amphetamine abuse. That's when that old-timer jumped up and cussed her out. But the one thing she said, and this is the real reason why I stayed, she said her whole life growing up, some kids wanted to be doctors. Some kids wanted to be lawyers, and all she ever wanted to do when she grew up was just not to be an alcoholic like her mom. And when she said that, I just started to cry, and I couldn't stop. And I cried throughout, I cried throughout the rest of the meeting because that's absolutely the first time that I ever felt like I belonged. And I'm supposed to share with you what it was like, what happened to change me, and what I'm like today. And what happened to change me were the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I used to talk about them in detail, but when you add menopause and marriage and stuff, your story gets way long. So (laughs) I will let you know I did the first three steps out of the big book with my sponsor getting on our knees saying the third step prayer together, did my inventory according to the big book. But when I did step five, we did five, six, seven, and eight all at one time. My sponsor did not trust me to go home and contemplate on my own character defects. (laughs) It's a good thing I would have missed the one she told me I had at the top of my list. It was self-pity. I thought it was just... 
justify it. And she said, Michael, alcoholics can't afford justified self-pity. And then she gave me that old cliche, pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. You know, and so... Um, and uh, I went out there, and I, I started on my step nine, and I live in 10, 11, or 12. 10 is so important to me, you know, and I have to do step 10. And it's really, to me, step 10 is all the steps on a daily basis. You know, if you really read 10, 11 in the big book, it's all the steps on a daily basis. And I got for a while where I wasn't doing a real thorough 10. I was, uh, you know, kind of doing it in my head at night. I used to always write it, always at night. I just love it in the big book where it asks you those questions, and then it says, what could you have done better? That's so important. You know, what could you have done better? And uh, I stopped writing it out after I got married. You know, it was sporadic because, you know, my husband's there. You know, it's not as easy to write it. And, and um, you know, I, I start, my life started to get unmanageable. It really did. So I've had to start doing a written tenth step again every night, and it's like everything's falling in place again. It's just so important. But uh, I do my form of prayer meditation in the morning. I, uh, my husband and I get on our knees and pray together, third step, seventh step. We pray for God to direct our thinking. We pray to be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, self-seeking motives. And then I do a form of meditation on my own my own personal time with God. But my sponsor really did st stress the 12 steps. She broke it into three parts for me. That first part, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of doing those first 11 steps, she said, did not necessarily mean a belief in God. She said a lot of us believe in God when we get here. She said some people come in here and they have to make the 12 steps their higher power or they have to make the group their higher power. She said when you've had that spiritual awakening is where you've had that huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. You've had that change in psyche. You've had that change in attitude. Something about you is just different. You've had a transformation that comes from deep within. And when it comes to carrying the message, if I have 15 days of sobriety, I give my phone number to someone who has seven. She told me length of time was not the requirement for sponsorship in this program. She said the requirement for sponsorship in this program is that you have done your steps because the real job of a sponsor is to guide you through the steps of the program. Applying these principles in all my affairs, she said that meant I had to practice love and service at work, I had to practice love and service at home. I can't come into this program, walk that walk, talk that talk, and then go out in the world and act like a jerk. And my sponsor knew a lot about Bill W., and she told me right from the start that Bill did not like to use the same word twice, that character defects and shortcomings were the same thing. They're both the exact nature of your wrongs in step five that we get from step four, and that principles and steps are the same thing, at least according to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. She said if I was applying these principles in all my affairs, that meant I was applying these steps in all my affairs. And she said if I was willing to grow along spiritual lines and I stayed current in my steps, eventually someday God would reveal to me when it's time to give up other destructive behavior. She told me it was not okay to just not drink but to go ahead and steal. It's not okay for me to just not drink but to abuse my daughter. It's not okay for me to just not drink, but to prostitute. It's not okay for me to just not drink, but to binge my brains out and take diet pills. She told me if I was working the last part of the 12th step in Alcoholics Anonymous, those things were not okay. But thank God she told me I didn't have to do it all at one time, or I surely would have failed, because all those things I just mentioned were listed on my step six, my character defects, and I don't practice any of them today, and I haven't for a very long time. Now I have new character defects. <laughs> Today I'm judgmental and opinionated. <laughs> but I pay, I pay a heavy price for that. I really consciously work with my higher power on not judging because this is my experience. When I get into judging you, I end up walking in your shoes, experiencing your experience to get over the judgment. And that is a very heavy price to pay. And I'm not willing to do it today. I'm just not willing to do it today. So or that's one thing God and I work on together. Um, so I'm, nine months, I'm six months sober. I'm on my ninth step. My sponsor told me I had to get a job. I had to be fully self-supporting for my own contributions, and I don't know how to work. And I went out there, and I got that first job, and that's where I learned how to work. I learned things like how to get there every day how to get there on time, how to not leave early, how to only take a 30-minute lunch break. I did not know how to do those things, and I learned them here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I worked my first job full-time for eight years. I stayed on another two years part-time after I took another full-time position, so I was there for a total of 10 years. When I left that job, I'd worked myself up to assistant administrator. And in that first eight-year period, I went back to high school. I did not 
I was not smart enough to pass a GED. I had to go back to high school. So I graduated from high school in 1985, and I was 36 years old. And I graduated with a cap, a gown, a real ceremony, and 450 18-year-olds. <laughs> truly humble. <laughs> what I did for the next six years is I went to work for a musical theater corporation, and this was equity, and equity means union, which means that they dealt with big, big major stars. And uh, it was a multi-million dollar corporation, and I started out at the very bottom in the accounting department, and I went back to school. And within a period of time, I worked myself up to business manager of this multi-million dollar corporation. And as business manager, I dealt with millions of dollars. And this is the honest God truth. When I got to this program, I didn't even know how many zeros were in a million dollars. I have negotiated, I have participated in union negotiations, and I've been invited into some of the homes of some of the most famous people you see on stage, screen, and TV. And even today, I'll see myself in a picture with a very famous person, and I just get overwhelmed. And I just think, how did I ever get from the gutters of Long Beach and being invited into some of these places and how that happened is I worked the last part of that 12th step and I applied these principles in all my affairs. I want to share a story with you of how um, I was business manager and as business manager I was 10 years sober and the first time in my life absolutely everything was perfect. Just absolutely, I thought everything was perfect. And I went to a, a birthday party for Debbie Reynolds. Nowadays, um, everyone's so young, they're not the least impressed. They don't know who Debbie Reynolds is. <laughs> but when I was young, Debbie Reynolds was my very favorite movie star, so I was very impressed. You know, I'm going to her 57th birthday party. And um, anyway, uh, you know, at that party, I almost drank. And I was 10 years sober. You know, the big book says you'll be placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected if you're in fit spiritual condition. I was not in fit spiritual condition. In the first place, I hadn't been into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in over two years because I am just much, and not two years, two weeks. <laughs> Everyone's like, whoa. <laughs> I hadn't been to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in over two weeks because I'm just much too busy growing in the business world. I'm not working with any um, other alcoholics because I'm much too busy going to school and growing in the business world. And I started getting into this thinking, thinking, and I started think, thinking thoughts like, well, maybe now that I have this very impressive job, and I drive a brand new car, and I have an education, and I'm not that little girl from the other side of the tracks, maybe I'm really not an alcoholic. And thank God I didn't act on it that night, because one healthy thing I've done for myself is I did not have anonymity at work. Everybody at work knew I was sober in the program at Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had enough respect for this program that I didn't want to embarrass it by drinking in front of my coworkers. So I put it off that night. I had planned to take a drink the next day. And the next day, I just think anybody who's worked these steps as hard as I had worked these steps, God had a chance to intervene, because the next day I was asked to pay a 12-step call on a makeup artist. This man hadn't shown up at work in two weeks. He was held up in this motel. The motel called my place of employment and talked to the executive executive director, and the executive director approached me and asked me to see what I could do. And I was resentful. I didn't want to go. It interfered with my plans. I got another alcoholic to go with me, a male alcoholic. We went over to this, trudged over to this motel, and I knocked on this guy's door, and I identified myself, Michael Alcoholic. I said, it's Michael. I'm an alcoholic. And for some reason, he answered the door. If that had been me, I wouldn't have answered the door. And he stood there, and I was absolutely speechless. I didn't recognize him. You know, the man I knew was a makeup artist. He had all this blonde wavy hair. He's a big hunk of a specimen. This man standing in front of me is bald-headed. He's ten times his normal size because he was so bloated. He was profusely sweating. He was bleeding from head to toe because he kept falling into objects. He smelled of alcohol. He smelled of urine. And he smelled of vomit. And as I stood there speechless, I had a spiritual experience. I had an inner voice talk to me, and it was loud and it was clear, and it said, Michael, this is you. You are not like the people you were with last night. If you drink again, you're standing in front of a mirror. And that man doesn't know it, but he's the one who paid a 12-step call on me. Because that night I got my fanny into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I resubmitted to this program. I go to more meetings than I've ever gone to. I work with more alcoholics than I've ever worked with, because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the longer I'm sober, 
the more I need meaning. The longer I'm sober, the easier it is for me to forget where I came from. That's why, that's probably the only thing I really like about speaking is, aside from meeting all you wonderful people, is I get up here and I remind myself constantly where I came from. And that's why I share my drink a lot, because I need to remember where I came from. I'm going to share one last story with you, and then I'm going to close. And it's how I came to terms with the God I have in my life today. I told you that my daughter was 15 years old when she got sober. At the age of 18, she had three years of sobriety. She and her daughter went to an AA dance. In fact, Kelly and I were just talking about she used to go to this club. It was Milano Club, and um, they have this big AA dance every week. And anyway, my daughter um, went to this dance with her friend, and they were leaving, and they were in the parking lot of the dance, and a man came up to him with a gun and forced these two girls in the car at gunpoint, and he kidnapped them. He knocked the one girl unconscious and brutally raped my daughter for over two hours. And I absolutely hate the word rape because it sounds like it's just about sex. But rape is really about terror, and it's about violence. And the whole time that this was going on, he knew, my daughter knew he was going to kill her anyway. And she was so angry at God, it took her over two years to remember that she did say a quiet prayer to live. This man was drinking. He had a bottle of alcohol in his pocket that he drank throughout the whole ordeal, thank God, because he got quite drunk. And at the point where he was forcing my daughter into the trunk of the car, somehow my daughter got the courage to at least make some kind of an effort to try to save her own life. And she caught him off guard. She slugged him in the face as hard as she could. He tripped and fell down. The gun slid under the wheel, and she ran down the street naked, and she got away. At that point, he got back into the car and took off with the car. And later on, down the road someplace, he rolled the other girl out into the street. So both girls lived. But the road of recovery was real hard, and it was real long. My daughter and I felt absolutely betrayed. How could God let this happen to us? We were both sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. How could God let this happen to us? We were working these steps as hard as we could, and this is a spiritual program. But the hardest thing for me to deal with was a sentence in the big book. I used to tell people to read it all the time. It's on page 449. And and I still like that part on acceptance. I still like that. But that one sentence says absolutely nothing in God's world happens by mistake. Clancy says alcoholism is a disease of perception. I'm still an alcoholic. I still get my disease of perception because I perceive that to mean that if nothing in God's world happens by mistake, then that had to be an act of God. It had to be an act of God. And I wanted to leave Alcoholics Anonymous, and I wanted to leave God because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I didn't want any part of a God that could operate like that. And thank God for the old timer I talked about earlier, Bill Honeycutt. He just took me by the hand and he said, Michael, God is good and good is God. And if it's not good, it's not of God. He said, man has free will. That man was acting on his free will and your daughter was just a victim. He said, if man didn't have free will, we wouldn't all be sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We'd all be perfect people. And when he told me that, I had a spiritual release, and I knew he was telling me the truth. And I love to hear my sponsor, Polly, share. She always talks about finding God deep within. And that's what it says in the big book. It says we find God deep within. And on that same page, it says it may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things. And when I'm into fear, even today, when I'm into fear and I'm into calamity, I feel disconnected from my higher power. And that's when I so desperately, desperately need the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because if God is deep within me, then God is deep within you. And it's at these times that God will reach out to another member of this program and pull me back into the sunlight of the Spirit. And that's what happened to me through a man named Bill Honeycutt. So I came to terms with my God again, but I still had so much trouble with that sentence in the big book. I could hear somebody in the lobby talk about something wonderful, say that sentence, and I would feel absolute rage. And I sponsor a lot, a lot of women in this program. And because I have the story I have, I sponsor women who have suffered terrible tragedies. And one of these women whose tragedy was worse than my daughter's made the mistake of telling me that her tragedy must be God's will. Because in the big book it says, absolutely nothing in God's world happens by mistake. This woman desperately needed comfort, 
and I went off on her like a crazy woman, and I started screaming at her to the top of my lungs that that wasn't written by the first 100 alcoholics. It's not in the first 164 pages of the big book. I slammed the big book down. I said, that's not even in the first two editions of this book. And I made this woman cry. And I knew at that point that I was the one who had a problem. I have a resentment about something in the big book. And this resentment is not only hurting me, now it's hurting other people. And I came to a place of really being willing to give it up. And I prayed for a very long time for God to help me with that sentence. And about seven years ago, I was with my sponsor, Polly, and she was as the speaker in a little meeting in the city of Long Beach, and uh, she was sharing about a tape by Clancy, and if she was up here speaking at this podium, she'd go, go see Dave and buy this tape. And the name of this tape is Alcoholism, Disease of Perception, and Clancy was talking to a group of doctors. It wasn't even an AA talk, but it's a fabulous tape. And right in that meeting, when she said the words, Disease of Perception, I had the biggest spiritual encounter that I have ever had. And I couldn't hear another word Polly said, and I couldn't see anything in in the room. It was like a big white light. And I had this inner voice talk to me again. And it was loud, and it was clear, and it wasn't through the ears. And it said, Michael, you know what happens in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous is part of God's world. What happens when you're working those 12 steps is part of God's world. The progression of all good is part of God's world. What happened in that car nine years ago was part of man's world. So when I came to a place of being able to separate man's world from God's world, I was able to come to terms with that sentence in the big book. And I, too, can stand here tonight and tell you absolutely nothing in God's world happens by mistake. It's God's world that got me to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. So two weeks after I had that experience through a real weird series of coincidences, I found myself sitting down at a dinner table right next to Dr. Paul, and um, who wrote that sentence in the big book. And I was at such peace, I did not have to go off on this man <laughs> and tell him all about my resentment. Because I knew at that point it did not matter what he meant when he wrote it. What mattered was how I perceived it. And I have to sometimes work on my perception so my perception can work in my life. And that might not work for you, and that's okay, because I truly believe that God works for each one of us at our own level of understanding. I once heard if you take one step towards God, God takes ten steps towards you. And in this lifetime, as we know it, we will never, ever reach God's level of understanding. But once we're on a spiritual path, God does not want to lose one of us. So he comes to each one of us. He works for each one of us at our individual level of understanding. And that's why what works for you might not work for me. What works for me might not work for you. But the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous is whatever you believe, it will work within the 12 steps. Since that day, that man's heard my talk. We've had lots of spiritual talks. We've talked at lots of conventions together. And he soon became my spiritual advisor, and I really miss him a lot today. He died on the 19th. But what he told me about that sentence was that he did not mean anything like that when he wrote that sentence. He told me he was not thinking of man's inhumanity to man. He said my spiritual experience was the best explanation he could think of as to why evil exists in this world. And I am so thankful I paid attention to something I read in the 12 and 12 under step 10. It said restraint of pen and tongue. Because when I found out this man was still alive, I used to think everybody in the big book was dead. <laughs> and if we don't come out with the fourth edition, uh, they will be. You know. <laughs> Anyway, when I found out this man was still alive, I cannot tell you how many countless times I sat down and I started to write him a hate letter and tell him exactly what I thought about him and exactly what I thought about that sentence. And if I would have followed through, I would have missed out on this gift because today this man is it became a gift in my life. And he used to get lots of letters about that sentence and he used to get lots of phone calls about that sentence and what he did a lot of the time is he just gave them my phone number. 
<laughs> I'm still having a hard time talking about him in the past tense. You know, it's just really hard for me. But I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. I know today I've been catapulted into what Bill calls the fourth dimension of, ex- of existence. And I love talking about the fourth dimension because Bill liked talking about the fourth dimension. He talks about it on page 25. He says, rocketed into that fourth dimension. But my favorite page is page 8 because on page 8, he gives you a description of what that fourth dimension is like. And I can tell you today, I know happiness, I know peace, but best of all, absolutely best of all today, I know usefulness. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.